this is your first time here, we are glad you're here. Um, we like to say that Shift is a worship service seeking authenticity. That just means we want to be ourselves here. Um, and that's, you know, not always easy thing to do. But that's our hope. We hope that you will come here to be yourself. Uh, God, who is a living, breathing, loving God, does it. he's not interested in some type of facade that you put on for the rest of the world. If anybody you can be real with, you can be real with God. And so we hope that you'll take that opportunity while you're here and to leave this place and maybe find that genuine love with God, that relationship with God that will sustain you and fill you. That's the hope of shift. It will continue to be the hope. So we're, we're grateful for that. Um, we've been in a sermon series now for a number of weeks about the prophecies of Christmas. That Christmas is a time we celebrate Jesus Christ's birth, is coming on to this earth, but it's not something that just happened out of nowhere. Uh, that God had been proclaiming for thousands of years that this King, the Savior, was going to come. We still have those prophecies in the Old Testament. And different prophets spoke about the qualities of this Savior, what He would be like, what He would do while He was here. And so we've concentrated really just on the prophecies of Christmas. Just the moment, that snapshot of when Jesus Christ was coming down to this earth and those prophecies that we've seen in the prophets from that time. But there is so much more. If ever you want to see a miracle, just open up your Scriptures and read the prophecies of the Messiah and it will blow you away. You'll say, I can't believe I never even knew this was in here. So we've been looking at the different prophecies of the birth of Jesus Christ. We talked about the prophecy that He would be born in Bethlehem. We talked about the prophecy that he would be born of a virgin. We talked about the, the prophecy that he would come out of Egypt, that he would be the new Israel, that he would be the new Exodus. Well, today we're going to talk about a kind of sobering prophecy. This might, might be one of the more sobering of all the rest. You'll remember that there were these magi. We don't know much about them, but they come in from eastern countries and they have seen a star in the sky, and somehow or another it is attached to their religion that says to them that this is proclaiming a new king is to be born, and they are following it, and they come into the land of Judea to find this new king who is to be born. Where do they go? They go to, to King Herod, who at the time is the king of all of Judea. And they say, we've seen his star in the sky. We've come to worship him. Where is the king who's going to be born king of the Jews? Herod calls all the religious leadership over and he asks them, what do the Scriptures say? They believed in prophecy. They believed that God had already told them where this Messiah was going to be born. They all said, Bethlehem. We talked about that. But then Herod calls the wise, not the wise men, the magi over. Sometimes I think we call them the wise men. Calls the magi over and asks them secretly, what time did this star appear? Now the reason he does it in secret is he wants to find out how old this child is. And he doesn't want the rest of the world to know it because they may go and worship this child and give a new king a new throne, his throne. He don't want that to happen. So he does it secretly. And then he tells them, when you come to this, this king, would you tell me where he is so I too can go and worship him? And of course, his plot is not to go and worship him. It's to kill him. If you know anything about King Herod the Great in history, he is not the best of all kings. He was always trying to control his power. If anybody was coming up against him, he would fight against them. It didn't matter who you were. If you were a family member, he was also paranoid. Sometimes he wasn't paranoid and people were just coming up against him. But he killed his father-in-law because he was, thought the father-in-law was coming against him. His mother-in-law, his brother-in-law, he took care of the in-laws, no problem. His, uh, his mother, no, not his mother, sorry. His wife, three of his sons, his uncle, he gave the commands, if ever he leaves the country to some of his soldiers, kill these family members to make sure that the kingdom doesn't fall into their hands if I don't come back. So if I die while I'm gone, you kill these people and it'll all be good. 
It's said that Caesar Augustus said that it was better to be a pig in Herod's household than it was to be one of his sons. Because he was a Jewish man and he would eat kosher. He wouldn't kill the pig. But you can't say so much about his own children. Ten wives, twelve sons. He needed them all because they kept falling. Herod was a bad guy. If that's how he treated people who were part of his family, how do you think he treated those who weren't part of his family, who were going to be a new king? You think he had any problem wiping that person out? Not at all. And we don't have to guess at it because the Scriptures tell us. The Magi come to Jesus where he's born. They're told in a dream not to return to Herod, that it's a trick, and to leave some other way. When Herod realizes they're not coming back, this is what the Scriptures say. Then when Herod saw that he had been tricked by the Magi, he became very enraged. He sent and slew all the male children who were in Bethlehem and all its environs, in in other words, all the areas around it, from two years old and under, according to the time which he ascertained from the Magi when he called them over and said, when did the star appear? Then that which was spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled, saying, a voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and she refused to be comforted because they were no more. So that's the prophecy that we're going to look at today. It's from Jeremiah, 600 years written before the birth of Jesus Christ. Jeremiah 31, verse 15. If you have a Bible, you're more than welcome to open it up to to Jeremiah 31, 15. Uh, If you don't have a Bible, you can always get one on your phone. There's the Bible app. It's really accessible, easy, pretty easy to use. If you get confused, you can ask one of us and we'll help you to use it. If you don't have one to do that and you want to get a physical Bible, you just like the physical Bible, we'll get you one of those too. Or it'll be on the screen. But either way, we'll all be reading the Scriptures together. This is Jeremiah 31, 15. We're going to talk about verse 16 and 17 later in the sermon, but here's 15. Thus says the Lord, A voice is heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rachel is weeping for her children. She refuses to be comforted for her children because they are no more. Will you pray with me? Father Almighty, as we come to once again the words of the prophets that you spoke to them to tell to us, that are to teach us about Jesus, would you speak to us today? Would you help us to know Jesus even more deeply? Would you help us to know ourselves more deeply? We pray this in Jesus Christ's most blessed name. Amen. So it's a somewhat of a sobering prophecy that we're looking at today. Not the the most positive note to read this prophecy about the death of all these children in Bethlehem. But I think maybe out of all of the prophecies, I really can't say that, but I feel like this prophecy does such a good job of teaching us the gospel, of teaching us about who we are, about why Christ came into this world, what our relationship with Jesus is supposed to be, teaching us who God is and what God has done for us. In the story, in the prophecy, Rachel is weeping. She's crying. There's a lament. Who is Rachel? Well, we spoke about it probably three weeks ago, but to remind you, Rachel is the mother of Israel in Genesis. That there was this man named Jacob who was a manipulator, a conniver, a deceiver. God got a hold of him, changed him, gave him a new name, Israel. And from Israel were going to come 12 sons. From Jacob would be 12 sons. They would become the 12 tribes of Israel. Jacob, his beloved wife, was Rachel, considered to be the mother of all of Israel. And if you remember, Rachel dies in childbirth, and she's on her way to where? To Bethlehem, of all places. And Jacob buries her in Bethlehem, and it's said to this day, you can go to Bethlehem and see Rachel's tomb outside of the city. Here, Rachel, the mother of Israel, is crying, is weeping. For the loss of these children in Bethlehem, her place of death, and all around these different areas. 
Rama, the place where the wailing and the weeping can be heard, is about five miles north of Jerusalem. Bethlehem is about five miles south. They are on opposite sides of Jerusalem. So what this is telling us is that it is such a great mourning, it's such a great weeping, it's such a great crying that it can be heard as far as Rama. And in fact, the word Rama in the Hebrew means heights. So what we're being told is it's such a great mourning and a great weeping, it can be heard on the heights. It can be heard everywhere. That something tragic and terrible has happened. And Rachel, the mother of Israel, is weeping for her children and can't be comforted because they are no more. Now, this isn't the first time that Rachel weeps. The first time that Rachel weeps is when this is first prophesied in Jeremiah 31, 15. 600 years before. What was that about? Jeremiah is writing in the 600s. There's two kingdoms. There's the kingdom to the north, which is Israel. There's the kingdom to the south, which is called Judah. They're both Israel. It's very confusing. They decide to call the north Israel for some reason, but they're both Israel. The kingdom to the north by this time in the 600s has been completely destroyed. The Assyrians have come in as promised by God through the prophets because of what what all of northern Israel has done because of the sins they've committed, because of the idols they worship, because of the morality, the immorality, the terrible things that were going on in that day. And he warned them again and again, and finally the Assyrians have come in. They have wiped out the northern kingdom, completely wiped them out, taken them prisoner into Assyria where they live out their days and they implant foreigners in the northern part of the country. All that's left in Jeremiah's day is the southern kingdom, Judah, That's all that's left of the Israelites, the promised people of God. And they are no better than the northern kingdom. Imagine that. They do the same things. They have sinned against God. They have turned away from God. And so what Jeremiah is prophesying to these people in the south is he's saying the same thing is going to happen to you. The Babylonians are going to come in. Not the Assyrians. The Babylonians are going to come in. They're going to wipe you out. They're going to take you captive to Babylon, and there's going to be nobody left. Why would he do this? Why would God, of the people that he had chosen for himself, why would he do this to these people? It tells us, Jeremiah prophesies, God speaking through Jeremiah says this in Jeremiah, the people of Israel and Judah have provoked me by all the evil they have done. They, their kings and officials, their priests, their prophets, the people of Judah, those living in Jerusalem, in other words, everybody, Everyone, kings, officials, priests, prophets, people, Judah, Jerusalem. They turned their backs to me and not their faces. Though I taught them again and again, they would not listen or respond to discipline. They set up their vile images, this is idols, in the house that bears my name, in the temple, and they defiled it. They built high places for Baal, one of the Canaanite gods in the valley of Ben-Hinnom, to sacrifice their sons and daughters to Melech. Though I never commanded, nor did it enter my mind, I couldn't even imagine what we would say, you know, that they should do such a detestable thing and so make Judah sin. He says again in Jeremiah 16, when you tell these people all this and they ask you, why has the Lord decreed such a great disaster against us? What wrong have we done? What sin have we committed against the Lord our God? Then say to them, it's because your ancestors forsook me, declares the Lord. They followed other gods, they served and worshipped them, they forsook me, and they did not keep my law. But you have behaved more wickedly than your ancestors. See how all of you are following the stubbornness of your evil hearts instead of obeying me. Now, the shame of that statement is it's still true today. See how all of you are following the stubbornness of your evil hearts rather than obeying me. So I will throw you out of this land into a land that neither you nor your ancestors have known, and there you will serve other gods day and night, for I will show you no favor. In other words, you're not going to have a choice but to serve other gods because I'm not going to do anything for you. Now these are the promised people of God. That God said, I will bless the whole world through you. And now God is talking about their complete destruction, about all of them being taken prisoner from Babylon, And in fact, he says that some will die by the sword, some will die by starvation, and others will be led into captivity. 
And Jeremiah gets to this part of the prophecy today. And he says, Rachel is weeping. Lamentation, bitter mourning for her children. She refuses to be comforted for her children because they are no more. Because Israel is now going to be destroyed. And she's weeping in Bethlehem. And it's heard on the heights. 600 years later, Rachel is crying again for the death of her children from this madman, Herod. How does this connect to Jesus? Well, it's to teach us of the world that Jesus Christ came into. To teach us of the real situation of the gospel. Because I think sometimes we don't really believe the situation that we are in, and we all know. It's crazy. For instance, Christmas. Christmas is a beautiful, beautiful occasion, right? Where we get to be with family and friends and have joy and, and peace on earth and goodwill to men, right? That's what we always say, you know? Goodwill to people. This is what we're going to do during Christmas time. And we have our nativities all set out, and, and they're just so beautiful in the nativities because everybody there is worshiping Jesus. You know, the animals are worshiping Jesus, and there are the shepherds, and there's the magi with their gifts and all their offerings and and there is everything that we see in Christmas, and there's Mary and, and, and Joseph looking all good and everything like that, and it just looks like a beautiful image of Christmas that we have every year. We put it out, I put it out on my little, you know, thing. But honestly, that's not the whole story of Christmas. <laughs> Christmas, we sometimes whitewash it. Yes, was the world glorifying that God was sending suddenly this Savior? Absolutely. Were these shepherds in perfect white robes as they were in this place of animals when it tells us they had been keeping watch over their sheep by night? Probably not. They probably stank. They probably smelled real bad when they came to Jesus. Mary and, and, and Joseph, were they exhausted from a long trip they took from Nazareth while Joseph's wife is pregnant, okay? And they're taking this long trip from Nazareth to get to Bethlehem. They end up at Bethlehem. She begins to give birth. They can find no room anywhere for them in an inn, in a nice place to stay. So they stay in probably what would have been a cave where the animals would have gone. And I love the image we always put of Jesus in perfect hay in this nice little manger, okay? Because He was in a feeding trough. And it was not necessarily built to hold a child. Sometimes we tell the story with taking out all the negative, all the difficulty, all the, the darkness, the fact that they were rejected. Imagine how exhausted Mary and Joseph would have been. And then, of course, we never talk about the death of the innocents. We never talk about the death that Herod had come and was a madman killing these, these children. Because we whitewash it. You know, the same is true of our Christianity. And the worst part about it is we think we're doing a service. We whitewash it by saying that Christianity is really just about love, which it is. But we don't talk about the cost of that love. The blood of our precious Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We talk about all peace, but we don't also talk about the violence in the Scriptures. We talk about that really it's probably more just a self-fulfillment type of Christianity. It's where we come together every Sunday as families and, and worship and, and praise God, but we miss the fact that Jesus Christ calls every single one of us to die to ourselves. To be put up on the cross as He was put up on and to be reborn because we whitewash our Christianity too. N.T. Wright said it like this. He said, for many, Christianity is just a beautiful dream. It's a world in which everyday reality goes a little bit blurred. It's nostalgic. It's cozy. It's comforting. But real Christianity isn't like that at all. Take Christmas, for instance. A season of nostalgia, of carols and candles and firelight and happy children, but that misses the point completely. Christmas is not a reminder that the world is really quite a nice old place. It reminds us that the world is a shockingly bad old place. No room for Jesus. The death of the innocents. Where wickedness flourishes unchecked. Where children are murdered. 
Christmas is God lighting a candle. And you don't light a candle in a room that's already full of sunlight, obviously. You light a candle in a room that's so murky that the candle, when lit, reveals just how bad things really are. The light shines in the darkness, says St. John, and the darkness has not overcome it. Christmas, then, is not a dream. It's not a moment of escapism. Christmas is the reality which shows us the rest of reality. Because our lives aren't whitewashed. Because what you struggle with isn't whitewashed. Because what we see in our world isn't whitewashed. This is what that prophecy means. It means it's a dark world. There is evil in this world. There are things that we come up against in this world. Lest we should think that 2,000 years ago, That there just was this crazy person, and really from that time period, we have become a great people who are just different. Nobody kills children anymore in the name of power. The 20th century is perhaps the bloodiest century in all of time. And more children, I would argue, have been killed in this century than all of the others. 1.5 million children killed by the Nazis. 1.5 million for power. I went to Cambodia, Pol Pot, who killed half of his population. I don't know why. Killed half of them. Went there, saw the killing fields where there was mass murder. And their children, they never wasted bullets on their children. They just used what they called a killing tree. Now this isn't to shock you. It's not to tell you something that isn't true. It's not to paint the world in a light that it isn't so. It's to tell us the genuine world that you and I live with. Where madness runs rampant. Where there is evil in the heart of humanity. Lest you should think that that's just other people who have that evil and not yourself. Maybe you wouldn't be willing to do what Herod did. But I think in our culture we sacrifice our children every day for them to just fit in to culture. We would rather them fit in with the rest of culture than to ever worry about their soul. What their relationship with God is like. What's more important, and this isn't just self-serving though it comes out that way, what's more important to you, bringing them to a game for sports or bringing them to church to hear about God? I'm not condemning you. It's me too. It's my family too. It's all of us. We sacrifice our children. We sacrifice them in a very different way in the name of our dreams and our desires. Where we are not the parents that we were called to be for them because it's more important for us to achieve our success and our greatness in this world than to actually raise up these children who God has given us into our hands. And we sacrifice them even before they're ever born for the name of convenience. Rachel is still weeping. She is mourning. And her voice can be heard across the world. It is our reality. But, aren't you so glad there's a but? Aren't you so glad that all is not darkness? Aren't you so glad there's a glimmer of a light, of a candle that will not be put out in this world? I am. You see, that's the first part of the prophecy. That verse 16. A voice is heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rachel is weeping for her children. She refuses to be comforted for her children because they are no more. But it continues. In verse 16 and 17. Thus says the Lord, restrain your voice from weeping. And your eyes from tears. For your work shall be rewarded, declares the Lord. And they shall return from the land of the enemy. And there is hope for your future, declares the Lord. And your children shall return to their own territory. 
Now Rachel is weeping and crying in Jeremiah about the fact that the Israelites are being exiled. All of her children will be no more. She believes this. But then suddenly a voice speaks to her, the voice of God who says, stop your weeping, stop your crying. Your children will be resurrected. They will return. There is hope for your future. She says this in the, he says this in the 600s. 600 years later, when children are being put to death in Bethlehem, when it seems again that Rachel will have no more, that these kids are gone and they are dead and they are buried, God again speaks to her through that Scripture and says to her, wipe your eyes and your tears. There is hope for your future. These children will return from the land of the enemy. Who is the enemy? Death itself. And your work will not be in vain. And God will save them. You see, Jesus Christ didn't come into a pretty nice old world. He came into an ugly world. In the land of the enemy. You know the enemy. If you've lived any amount of time on this earth, you know the enemy. Sin here. Sin in your heart. The enemy of sin out there in the world. The enemy of death and decay. This is the enemy's land. We are in and being controlled by the enemy. By sin and by death. If you don't believe that, is there any single person in here who by their own willpower has been able to overcome sin in their life completely? Just raise your hand. It's time for you to be glorified. Anyone? One? Then sin has power in this land. Anyone who's overcome death? Death itself and decay. Anyone? I know sometimes we want to try. Anyone has succeeded? Then this is the enemy's land. And death and decay and sin have control on us. Jeremiah says to the Israelites this. This is what the Lord says to the Israelites in Jeremiah. Your wound is incurable. Your injury beyond healing. There is no one to plead your cause. No remedy for your sore. No healing for you. No soup for you. No healing at all for you. None. None. There is nothing in this world that will overcome your darkness. Nothing in this world that will overcome your sin. Nothing in this world that will overcome your death. There's no, there's no cure. But God says this, but I will restore you to health and heal your wounds. He just told them the wounds are incurable declares the Lord. Jeremiah 23. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, a king, who will reign wisely, do what is just and right in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved. And Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called the Lord, our righteous Savior. Do you see, brothers and sisters, we are in a land where the enemy is in control. And there is no cure on earth for our enemy. Nothing for your sin. Nothing for your death. We believe a whole different story most of the time, but we're just kidding ourselves if we're truly honest. We can't find a way out. How will we get out? We need something that is not from this earth. We need something from heaven. So God sent His Son from heaven to enter into the land of the enemy. He was free. He did not need to enter into this land for Himself at all. And yet He came. And He took the enemy to Himself. He took sin upon Himself. It says in the Scriptures that He who knew no sin became sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God. 
He took death, the power of death upon Himself, crushed them to His chest upon the cross, and He died, and sin and death looked like it had won the battle, that this is the enemy's land, and no one gets out of here alive, except that Jesus Christ rose from the grave. Except that Jesus Christ defeated death itself. Except that Jesus Christ defeated sin. It could not keep its hold on Him. And so He is calling to you today to tell you to wipe your tears. To stop your crying and mourning and lamentation for your lostness in the land of the enemy. For one who has come out from the land of enemy came to bring you out. To bring you home to God. And even though it seems like we are against the strongest enemy of all, He proved it when He rose from the grave. And He offers that to each one of us. A taste of His Spirit. The Spirit that will overcome sin in your life. Today, I didn't believe it. Of course, I didn't know I was the most sinful man in the world. It just happened to be that way. And God showed me. And suddenly He gave me power to overcome sin when I thought this was the enemy's land. The enemy always told me I'd come back. I was His. Suddenly I got broke free. And that's just a part of the promise. Because we are being drawn towards a day when the enemy's land is no longer the enemy's land. It's God's land. Full of God's people. Listen to the image that's told to us in Revelations, the very last book of the Bible. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people. It's God's land. And He will dwell with them. They will be His people and God Himself will be with them and be their God. Listen to what He will do. He will wipe every tear from their eye. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. Rachel has stopped weeping. He who is seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. You can take it to the bank. Who's the one on the throne? The king who was born. Jesus. And he is making everything new. What you see around you today, brothers and sisters, are the death throes of a defeated enemy. And if you have found yourself in that place, if you feel as though sin has just had its hold on you and you don't know how to be free from that enemy, I will tell you, the Scriptures tell you, if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. He can break it. If you've seen only mourning and crying and pain and death all around you, and you feel as though death is going to have the last word, know that death has been swallowed up in victory through Jesus Christ. And that one day there will be no more death, there will be no more crying, there will be no more pain, for we follow the One who has defeated death and sin itself upon the cross and through His resurrection. And He will give that same power to you if you will follow Him and trust Him and obey and turn away from the stubborn evil hearts we have and turn back to God and say, God, I will follow You to the ends of the earth past the enemy's land to the place you are bringing me today. For I know you are good. I know you are love. I know you have come to bring me home. And so I will follow you home. Or did you not think that Jesus knew where he was going? And we just follow. He circles around. Now he's going home. And he's bringing us from the enemy's land. We need people who believe it. We need people who put their lives in Jesus Christ's hands. 
We need people who know that Christianity isn't a color, rose-colored story. That it tells the way the world really is, but it tells us how to escape from it. And the hope in Jesus Christ. So this morning, if that's you, I want you to lift your heart up to Jesus. I want you to say to Jesus, Jesus, I have felt trapped. I know the enemy. I know his hand on my heart. I know his hand on this world. I've seen the death and decay all around me. I know people are mourning and crying and pain, but I don't want to cry anymore and I don't want to mourn anymore. I want to follow you. I want to follow you for my life. Give me the strength to walk towards you and trust you that I might be made new. And I might serve you and help to tell the world of the hope of the world. This is Christmas. This is Christmas. And we try and write a different story. We've done an injustice because that's quite the story. Will you stand and we'll pray together?